Welcome to the Real Triathlon Podcast. I'm your host, Garrick Lowen, here with Nicholas Chase and Jackson Laundry. I'm going to bring it in this time. I haven't brought it in in a long time. Welcome back to the Real Triathlon Podcast. This is Jackson Laundry here with Nicholas Chase. We're just going to bring you guys a little bit of news, what we're thinking on what's been going on, which is the big news in triathlon right now, the horrific accident that happened at Ironman Hamburg is what we're going to start with. We will be having a really great interview with Travis from the Daily Try as well. Stick around for that. But this morning, woke up, jump on the Instagram, see what's happening in Hamburg. And unfortunately, you know, the first thing I saw was that there was this terrible crash. And it just, you know, it really sucks to see things happen in the sport that seem preventable, especially uh, when it comes to safety out on the course. But it, it was such a bad incident that I think a lot of people just stopped watching the race because they were sort of appalled with what had happened and how I think Iron Man just kind of didn't really give much attention to the issue in the coverage and they sort of just ignored it, which, you know, there can be some discussion that went on there. But Nick, what were your first sort of reactions when you sort of saw this news this morning? Well, first and foremost, I didn't know what the hell was going on. All I saw was like a like a quotation thing on the Pro Tri News Instagram that popped up that said we're devastated by this, and I was like, "What the hell happened?" And I couldn't find anything related to what actually happened. So then I checked our group chat for Real Tri Squad, and you were like already reporting on it and letting us know what happened. So I feel like none of us knew the story. I don't even know if there's been a lot of press release about it outside of just some, some little nibbits. But anyways, it sounds like even the pro athletes in the race may have like been frustrated by the tr- amount of traffic back and forth on such close quarters with motorcycles on one side and pros and the age group is on the other side. So it seemed like this was just a really terrible scenario that I don't, I don't know if it's like this every year either. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I agree with that. First off, I kind of saw like, oh, geez, like at first I was worried. Was there like a terrorist attack or something crazy? Thank God that didn't happen. But yeah, it was um, I the sort of the numbers I heard quoted from multiple different athletes who were in the league group as well as athletes who were in the second group was that there were 18 total motos with the front group of nine athletes. Um, And you actually could see this on the coverage. I didn't really watch much coverage, but I did watch the little piece that showed the accident. Um, and it was horrific. There was, there were, there was a huge line of media motos. Like I, you couldn't tell how many, there were so many lined up all together and they were kind of all blocking each other. But you see one moto passing the other line of motos that are, so the, the motos were in the center of the road. The athletes were riding on the right side of the road. There was a decent gap, you know, sideways, like there was a couple meters from the athletes like that. That's relatively standard. But in some of these roads, they're narrow. So then there's if there's athletes coming in the other direction, you end up with motos like right on the middle line or even a little bit over the other side of the road, which is not very safe. And then you had one moto that had to make a pass. He was passing all the motos in the group for whatever reason. You know, they get communications with the positions that they're supposed to be in or what's happening in the race and they're just instructed to move. And unfortunately they were passing on the exact wrong side of the road and did have a head on collision with the cyclist. And that was just out of frame, but you just saw the moto kind of drive by. Then you just see the cyclist that had just hit the, the, you know, the motorbike fly across the road and it happened right with the lead athletes. They all saw it. They all heard it and they're all in shock. Like, all the social media posts are about how crazy this was and how frustrated and sad it is. And, you know, I, I witnessed a pretty minor crash at Gulf coast and that rattles you to see something where unfortunately the motorcycle driver did die. And I know that the cyclist was severely injured. I'm not sure on their state at this point, but it's pretty crazy. And, you know, I think the main uproar with this one is that Ironman didn't really seem to take much responsibility if any for the accident and there were just too many motos and it just wasn't safe and that's what you know the bottom line is so in terms of taking that responsibility like i'm i don't know if there's protocol that they even have for i mean and i'm sure they must have 
a disaster response protocol for where they probably shut down all outlooks of commentating or whatever until they get every ounce of data. Um, and so I think now is a pretty good time, you know, for them to release anything since it is affecting pretty much everybody who's going to race an Ironman event. Like if you race an Ironman event, you shouldn't have to worry about getting hit by a vehicle. And and I can just say from experience, Jackson, you can too. There's been so many times when the moto drivers are doing the best they can, but they just aren't aware with the speeds that some of us carry or travel into a corner. And I've almost had to come to a complete stop or lay my whole body into the side of a motor motorcycle as I'm trying to bank a corner because they didn't give enough space. So as much as they tell us in the pro briefing, like we have a very experienced crew and all the motor drivers are vetted and all that stuff. Like I really am hesitant from now on to wonder what the fuck that actually means. Like, well, uh, Kevin got sick. He's our really good guy, but Dale came in from Slovakia last night on a red eye. I guess he's good too. Like, is that happening ever? Or that's something we all should be really checking. Yeah. It's, there's just so many things like, you know, they did have a kind of a disaster protocol. They obviously had to shut the entire road down. So what happened was they ended up having the athletes get off their bikes, walk their bikes off the road onto the, you know, there was sort of a, a small grass area where they could run alongside the road. Apparently it was about a quarter mile. They had to run their bikes and get back on the road and then return to racing. Um, you know, and I think that's fine. It, that was handled well enough, but I, I wasn't there, you know, I, I can't say for sure, but I think for me, the, the question is why are there 18 motorcycles with that lead group? And the more people you have trying to ride in the same area on the small roads, especially in Europe, a lot of these roads, like, you know, most of our audience is probably North American. The roads there just aren't the same. There's a lot of smaller country roads that are just, it's just the way that driving is the sort of culture there. They're used to driving and riding on smaller roads and that's seen as more normal. But when you get cyclists going both directions and motorcycles mixed in, you really want to try to minimize the number of motorcycles. And, and I, you know, if there wasn't a huge line of bikes, maybe that driver would have been able to pass quickly and get out of the way or whatever. So I just think that, you know, Ironman, I believe it was Ironman uh, Europe, did release a statement sort of saying they acknowledge the issue and, you know, they're obviously sent their condolences, but they didn't really take any responsibility. And they kind of said, we continue to, they basically said, we, we did our job. Like we made it as safe as we could. And I just think that's BS. I mean, you have 18 bikes with their leaders. That's not safe. And, and the, the cyclists were frustrated. Like all of them were frustrated at the end of that race. And even during the coverage, I think at times you could see that they were frustrated with the motorcycles. Yeah, it's almost like Iron Man does have strict media rights to, and, and to give media passes to certain vehicles. And they probably had the live broadcast motos. They had the referees. They maybe had a course marshal out there. Since it's Europe, they do things a little bit differently. But then they may have already had a bunch of other photographers who were just out there to capture photos and videos for the race who, for whatever reason thought that everybody needed to be at that front of the race getting, you know, the yawn. I mean, there was a pretty stacked who's who for all the male cyclists who were in that group. Like there was just a ton of talent there. So of course, all those journalists are going to want to be right there in the action. So that's probably where it comes down to is you can't just give away that many media passes, right? Maybe you've got to account that ahead of time. And I'm sure they probably... It's like the perfect storm. Like they probably were like, well, it's probably never been a big, big deal before, but on this small road system with this many top level athletes, with this much media coverage being offered as more of a standpoint for our sport, it could have just been a recipe that now we every single race director is going to have to look themselves or look at their staff and be like, holy shit, what else have we been letting go? Like hopefully Ironman 70.3, Gulf Coast race director is also like, well, I had two people get hit at my race this year or come into a collision with a vehicle. And last year, a pro female also got hit. So hopefully the race directors are really not going to take risks just to appease the local 
um, city of commerce, maybe they're going to demand more, maybe the roads in the, in some of these circumstances could also be controlled a little bit better. I, I don't know. It, it's the worst thing in the world that it takes such a tragic event for us to actually start taking these things seriously. And it's just like, that's human nature for some reason. I, I don't understand it, but something has to change. And I'm sure, you know, PTO being who they are, they're going to do what they can to probably try to be involved and use the athlete board to, to see if we can even provide some perspectives or help into this. I hope. Yeah. I mean, it's just scary when you think about how our, one of our most recent episodes, we were talking about how unsafe golf coast was. It's lucky that our friend Lauren wasn't hurt worse. And then you hear Elliot Bach got hit by a car that wasn't during a race, but that's obviously fresh in your mind. And then this happens in a race and you're like, holy shit, should I even be doing this? Like this sport is not safe, especially when it comes to vehicle collisions. That's always the worst scenario. If you're on your bike and you take a turn too hard or something and you crash, usually you're going to be okay because you're not colliding with a massive vehicle. Um, obviously like if you're, if there's cliffs and stuff around that can be extremely dangerous, but for the most part, you'll be okay. But when you involve other vehicles, it's just, it just adds so much more element of risk. And I think we don't take it seriously enough. And I, I know like we also complain about how coverage isn't great all the time, but w most of those motos were not live, live coverage motos. There was one or two for that. And the rest were, yeah, you know, outside media probably was the main source. Um, and it's, you know, I know there's different laws in different countries and it's hard to just say Ironman needs to regulate it better. Um, but you know, maybe Ironman needs their own regulations, you know, where it's a little bit more strict than just simply following the laws of that area. Um, yeah, it's just too terrible to, to hear about this. And, you know, in the coming days, I think we'll hear more perspectives from people who were there, but from what anyone who's in that group said was, you know, it was just, I think Ironman turned off the commenting on the video um, coverage because people were all, you know, wanting to know happened? about what happened in the crash and why was there media whatever and they just kind of ignored it and i don't know we'll see what kind of a statement is released or what they can do to make things better for the future but yeah it's uh it's pretty sad that it doesn't seem like the first thing you would have hoped to see was everyone's like oh it looks like there was a crash like you would have hoped to have a summary of what happened from iron man and just tell people because it, when you just try to hide all the information, it just doesn't make you look anything but guilty. I understand. I get it. Um, but the the problem is they probably just weren't even equipped for this type of, I mean, disaster. I don't think we've ever seen that type of collision during any broadcast for triathlons. So this is going to be something that changes the game. And for some more perspective, like I coach, I'm fortunate enough to coach an athlete who races – motor or the rally for Dakar and he rides his motorcycle sometimes, you know, hundred miles an hour in the open desert where anyways, what I'm trying to get to is the contracts that he is going for are part they're They're big because he's risking his life to go super fast on a motorcycle and push the limits and push the boundaries. And, you know, triathlon is, is a sport to where that doesn't really get thought of very often, but I've hit 60 miles an hour going down, a mountain pass before on my bike. And sometimes, and I've seen Joe Skipper slide out and go off into the road right in front of me when it was wet. Like we are actually still risking a lot going out there on these races. Every age group athlete is, it seems like when it comes to the amount of collisions that happen on course between negligence or unawareness. So I think there needs to be a little bit more emphasis put on how do we make the course safe first off, but how do we make sure that athletes are being, you know, compensated and treated like professional athletes, given healthcare, given some sort of a opportunity to take care of themselves when we are risking our lives and our bodies, especially on the daily training for, you know, thank God Elliot Box survived that. He got hit him and his training partner from behind by F250. I mean, the amount of bo broken bones he has is unreal. So that we're risking our lives for this sport and there's not a whole lot that is being done to keep that, you know, really relatively, you know, smart, but obviously I understand the other part of that is we're opting to do it. We're putting ourselves out there. No one's putting a gun to our head, but I still think there's a lot of more human aspect that we could consider to make sure that we're all being taken care of a little bit more 
uh, as a human being, not just some person who's on camera who if they get hit, that's the decision they made, right? Well, yeah, and I think the you know the the most highly professional races are going to have closed courses. I, I believe the PTO races have all been closed courses, if I'm not mistaken, at least the ones I've done. Um, that's a huge, and, and as each year that goes on, I put a higher and higher sort of, um, I guess, value on whether the course is closed or if it's not fully closed, if it's at least, you know, well policed and not too many intersections. And, you know, for example, a course like Indian Wells 70.3, I don't believe it's fully closed, but it really feels safe. There's sections that are fully closed. There's not cars coming in and out, like things like that matter to me now. And, and, you know, more and more as I get a little older and I'm not like this young guy who just thinks he's invincible anymore. Like you take those things into account and like, I'm doing all my training pretty much on the trainer now for this reason. I do not feel safe on the roads and this, and that's not, you know, obviously a race fault. That's just busy. You know, there's more and more people around and the ro- there's not becoming more space on the roads. There's just more cars. Um, but yeah, I, for sure I'm there with you, Nick. I, I wish that there was a little bit more ways to keep us safe and, and, you know, we'll see if things can come out of this in a positive manner, but in one thing, maybe in a positive manner might get you on Zwift to train with me tomorrow, our bike workout tomorrow morning. What do you think, buddy? But I'll get choked by my coach. He literally choked me. I already gave him a lot of pushback today and he was like, well, you do whatever you want, but eventually I'm not the one even coaching anymore. I was like, God damn it. I'll, I'll listen. (laughs) <laughs> but i do have a pretty sick workout on wednesday so i can but you probably won't train wednesday no thursday Shit. well anyways on one of these days we'll train together again but i think that's pretty much all we have on the hamburger issue we yeah. you know i did talk to matt hansen uh just by text um who was at that race who unfortunately didn't finish he was totally fine he just had a little bit of an issue on the run but um he was sort of like you know, in shock about it as well. And his position was sort of that, um, they, the, where they had the athletes running off the road, it was kind of weird and crazy. And like, nobody really knew what the best way to handle it was. And, and obviously you can't predict all these things and there's always going to be a chance for something. And, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it definitely takes away from, you know, the race, like we haven't even mentioned what happened in the race. I think it was a Dennis Chevrolet one and Jan was fourth. Christian Hogan, how was third and Peter Hemerick was second. Um, and, but everybody in their post race is kind of like, well, this happened, but it was a terrible day no matter what. Like, even if I won, you know, it was crazy. And, and that's gotta be traumatic. Like the crash literally occurred right beside the league group. All the leaders were there and saw it and sort of, you could see them like being like, what the hell just happened? Like, this is insane. Um, so we yeah. hope that this sort of thing never happens again in the racing we do, but speaking well of the said. racing we do a couple weeks left, Montreal Mont coming up, but for now we're going to get into the interview with Travis from the daily try. How did this interview come up, Nick? And like, sort of what's, what's the deal with this guy? Yeah. Um, Travis reached out to me actually. Um, he's, he's noticed real try squad doing some cool stuff and, wanted to get my perspective as to why we're here, what we're doing. And it was really super kind of him to ask, you know, a guy like me, who's not a tip of the spear of the sport right now um, to come on and talk about the business side and kind of what else I want to do within the sport. So that's why I was like, I really love what you're doing. The grind, the, the ambition, doing something that isn't really being done to this level yet. And I think he's going to take it to a big level. Um, So, and he's got a great, freaking voice i was like dude you you can listen you can talk about anything and make it sound really interesting um so we're going to talk about his story daniel becker guard looks like daniel becker guard's body double um and so we're going to find out about the daily try what's happening his ambitions who he is um and surely it's another podcast and video podcast you'll want to check out especially for his weekly race recaps which i'm sure jackson be part of and i'll i'll be part of somehow i'll get there get there for trombone i'm gonna get there drama you always have a good day to draw on, but we're gonna yes. make it happen i'm gonna do it anyways let's jump into that episode and uh thanks for being part of our show too we really appreciate you listening and uh please enjoy
Well, here we are. We are finally getting to the point of this podcast where we hear from our guest of the uh, the opportunity of a, a lifetime for all of us, right? Uh, Travis Mundell is joining us. And quick backstory, him and I just met recently, and he operates and owns and manages and does everything for The Daily Try, which I found out first through Instagram and obviously going into YouTube. And more than anything, there's probably a lot more that we don't know. We've got Jackson on here as well, who's going to probably learn about this for the first time also, since he's, you know, he's keeps his don't keeps pay attention the to things. world. Yeah, keeps the world to it at arm's length so he doesn't have to deal with all the bullshit. Um, that's last... not true. I was the first one to see about the news and things. Yeah, okay, you're fair. Okay, that was, that was good. Uh, but anyways, Travis, welcome. And first and foremost, just to kick this thing off, give me like three amazing things about yourself let's do the first one the daily try and its purpose the second one your favorite food and the third one what is your favorite super shoe okay all right so the daily try um yeah first of all thank you so much for having me i never thought i'd be asked to do a podcast this is kind of fun for me Uh, i don't think i'm the best communicator which has been the hardest thing about the youtube channel is i'm learning how to communicate better um but yeah the amazing thing about the channel i'd say and the purpose behind it is uh, i just wanted to help the sport grow i felt like um, other sports have amazing outlets and coverage and triathlon doesn't have necessarily the best like consistent like highlights and news um you know gt uh, gtn is amazing but uh, i wanted to add another another consistent voice there just for the pros uh when i started out so that was the goal and then um yeah, the other thing was favorite food, I believe. Yeah. Definitely. Um, this might sound weird, but it'll if I ever share my story, this will make sense. But uh, I just had it, baked beans on toast. I could eat that every day. Oh, shit. That. So, yes, baked beans on toast. And then- I knew that was a good question to ask. <laughs> I uh, don't really have a super shoe. I've never used a, a super shoe necessarily, uh, but I run in uh, New Balance is my favorite shoe, so- Okay. Well, those are great. Jackson, any uh, follow-up questions before I hit the next series of awesomeness? Well, I mean, the baked beans thing, we gotta, (laughs) we gotta, you can't just let that sit. Like you gotta (laughs) kind of go into that a little bit. Uh, No. Uh, So I was originally born in South Africa and uh, my, I was fourth generation born in Africa, kind of a long story there that I'll save you guys, but uh, Zimbabwe is a British colony and that's where my family's from. And so just got that British heritage in my family. Dude, real quick. When toast. I used to play hangman with my friends, the word that would always stump them, always, every time, was Zimbabwe. I used that word <laughs> relentlessly. Continue. Sorry to interject. No, yeah, that's uh, that's hilarious. That's um, Yeah, I was five when I left, so I don't have too much connection to it. Uh, I went back in the last few years uh, for the first time since I was that old. But uh, uh, yeah, that's where my whole family is from. And yeah, so pretty interesting fact there. Okay. We would have not guessed that by the lack of accent. Yes. Yeah. From Zimbabwe, I moved to Ireland, grew up in Ireland. And uh, we, that we sounded Irish. It was super bad. Yeah. That's about the only thing I say Irish. Um, but yeah. I left uh, then to come to the States when I was in high school. So, Dude, this is a, like, I'm just peeling back the layers here and I'm just want to keep asking more questions about this and that. So uh, before we get to a crazy amount of tangent, um, which yep. is what I tend to do, can you explain, so the Daily Try, um, obviously there are some networks, not even networks, uh, there's some folks out there like us. We're not really uh, doing the same thing. So I'd say if anything, it's more of like a, a sharing of collective awesome knowledge. We're not trying to pull guests and you know step on anybody's toes between us, but the guys like Pro Try News or, gosh, Jackson, what are some other podcasts, oh, how they train, what are some other ones that are doing stuff already? Well, there's the triathlon mockery and, you know, some, some pro athletes have their own ones as well now, which is cool. Um, you've got the uh, That Triathlon Life podcast. There's a lot more coming up in the last couple of years. And I think that sort of shows what's going on with the sport where it is does seem to be gaining momentum in, as far as media goes and like a bit more attention, better quality sort of coverage. Well, coverage for races has come up a little bit, but also just like more people talking about triathlon. So like a few years ago, you didn't really have 
a whole lot of sort of um, stuff focused on the pro side of things. The, the first one ever that did really was probably the TRS uh, podcast or whatever it was called, the real Starkey. And that, that kind of fizzled out quite a while ago now, but it seems like some other things have come up to fill the void. And that that's where you with the daily try are kind of sitting as well, like trying to bring more attention to the sport, especially on the pro side, which is pretty sweet to, to see. Great history lesson, Jackson. Uh, my question w- was actually though, um, what do you, you said, what are some to... other podcasts? Yeah, I know. But then you started like, telling us about the year that they were created. And it was like was... a 30 second. You go on rant for like 10 <laughs> minutes about nothing. It was directly related. It's all right. I'll forgive you uh, for trying to call me okay. out. Uh, def- <laughs> we're, you're deflecting. That's okay. It's a, it's a thing. Um, so what is the daily try looking to achieve that? others like where's the gap that you were like we gotta we gotta fill this gap we need to make my show a little bit different i want to focus on this what is the focus and is it also going to be more youtube video based because that's kind of how you hit me with like we're going to do a video show and is that more of your focus yeah definitely i mean when i first started it it wasn't specifically like oh you need to fill this gap that's all kind of developed since I got into it and saw potential actually was reached out to the feed like shortly after starting it and trying some things out and they were like man you got to make this into a business you got to do this often like we see a gap for it and I was like oh okay maybe I should keep doing this more uh funny enough um but yeah so I definitely want to keep it on YouTube as you know back when I was started training again for triathlons I always felt like I could consume more about the pros uh, when I was on the kicker and, you know, doing indoor training, and I wish there was just a little bit more out there, a, lore, a little bit more race previews on YouTube and just like, you know, I could consume all the pro content, um, but I wanted somebody like talking a little bit more about the stats of the race and uh, stuff like that, you know, recapping the race. Um, who inspired me a lot was Lantern Rouge. Uh, he does a cycling YouTube channel and yeah, he he's does good. the highlights and he does the commentary so well. Um, you know, I think whenever Jack Kelly does it on the how they train or the pro try news guys did it, you know, I think they do a great job. And uh, I just wish somebody was on YouTube, like Lantern Rouge, who can uh, give that little bit of visual perspective. And uh, yeah, so that was pretty cool. And that's, that's what I would like to do. I would like to keep uh, doing highlights, commentaries, race reviews, uh, race previews, uh, as I get more time to do it. Okay, so during our interview the other day, you mentioned you're a pilot. Yes. And is a, a commercial pilot for which airline are you allowed to say? I, uh, I'm not a commercial pilot uh, per se for the big airlines, but I'm commercially rated pilot. So I okay. flew in Boulder. I towed gliders up into the mountains there and I was a flight instructor, but I Sweet. don't fly much anymore because uh, I don't do it as a job anymore. And to uh, to just pay for it as a hobby is incredibly expensive. And uh, so I don't fly much anymore. Well, you've got my point to that was you've got like a very like if if you came over the the announcement and said something, I'd be like, "This I got to listen to this pilot. He's got. It doesn't <laughs> sound all mommy like we're gonna head over here five thousand feet." And like I, I could hear you enunciating actually as a pilot. So thank you for like actually bringing the voice and the look. I mean, you got everything you need to have a good video show. And who you wouldn't want to do a purely radio show. People are gonna want to see that smiling face over there. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. A lot of people did mention that, uh, that I had a pilot voice and, uh, uh, you know, you can't really tell what you sound like necessarily, you know, so I just took their word for it. And, uh, actually, Wait a second. Uh, you look like somebody in a pro triathlete thing. And I wonder if Nick's thinking the same person as me, Nick, who do you think he looks like? Uh, back guard. Yes. Daniel back guard. <laughs> interesting i never and you, say, and you sound like him actually you guys could be long lost twins you never know <laughs> i have to reach out to him yeah, yeah See we're gonna do, we have to do a side-by-side comparison during the show just to make sure that everyone knows this yeah we <laughs> should i think it's a thing it's gonna be like celebrity you know doubles cool Perfect. um so that makes sense you wanted to kind of expand a little bit more on i and i what i gather is there's more depth in what is actually happening with the sport that anyone's talking about. Sometimes what I've noticed in Jackson, I'd like to hear your perspective on this too, is if one thing happens, seven shows are talking about that same thing as fast as they can, almost like who can get there first and get the most clicks. And it leaves a lot of additional fluff and flair out there 
And I think kind of that's what over, over time we've eventually just kind of become that podcast for real triathlon podcast is we've not really just focused on, well, who's winning everything right now. We're like, we, I don't even think we've ever had Sam long on our show. Maybe we have Sam long on. I don't did know. He, did he agree? I think we did. I think we did quite a while ago, but okay. But, but yeah, it's tough. It's definitely a lot of the same, same people, the same narratives. And there's a lot to be sort of explored within the athletes that aren't necessarily the top 10% or whatever, like the, the athletes, you know, 50th beyond and below um, don't really get a lot of media coverage. And there's huge stories there. Like, I really think that some of those stories are, are pretty interesting. And yeah, you're right. All the, all the top media are going for the top athletes for the most clicks, which makes sense. And I do not blame them at all for doing that. And in, and, and even with us, like when we've had the higher, you know, sort of more, celebrity type athletes on those are our best episodes so it's hard to kind of totally um you know move away from that too yeah um and then moving to your show the daily try travis i really wanted to kind of get into the weeds a little bit on what does that look like for your workload because if it, you're looking to provide stats, maybe even getting coverage from race organizations that agree to work with you there's editing there's you know what is the show in a perfect world look like to you? Yeah, it is. The workload has been quite a lot. Uh, I've been working full time and then doing it when I got home. My uh, partner wants to kill me for doing it so much. But uh, recently, I actually just went to part time. Uh, I now write for Triathlete Magazine a little bit. So that's been able to uh, let me spend more time in the triathlon world, which has been nice. But ideally, I would love to do uh, just try make triathlon my job and do it full time. If that was the case, uh, I just started doing the interviews lately. I would love to do uh, more interviews. Uh, right now, I'm doing one a week. I'd love to do two or three. And like Jackson said, get more of the stories from those, you know, who might not be interviewed often. You know, uh, for example, like Simon Chi, I just interviewed. Amazing story. Um, you know, Trevor, he's up and coming. Uh, you know, he might not get a mainstream interview uh, that often. Nick, like your story. So I love talking to you for like the whole 45 minutes on the free zoom that we had. Um, uh, it was so good, but you might not get too many, uh, too many interviews like that. So I don't. I, that's, that's another gap I felt like I could fill and uh, I would love to do more of that. Um, yeah. Cause I do feel bad a little bit for the up and coming pros. I feel like that's uh, something that is a sad aspect about our sport and uh, I hope it gets better. I hope PTO eventually as it you know grows and gets bigger with the top athletes that they eventually uh, give start giving back to the you know lower ranked athletes to help grow the sport that way um so yeah so i'd love to do that uh, the weekly news is what my staple is so doing a once news roundup video um and then i would you know love to recap every race that comes out do the highlights commentate on that uh, that's kind of hard because iron man's the majority of the uh the races and so um getting copyright uh material from them and all that's been a challenge but the all the other race organizations so far have been pretty friendly and uh, accommodating and they really like the idea but that's taken a lot of reaching out emails constantly um so yeah that's that's been a, a lot of the workload actually it's just been a lot of emailing back and forth and uh trying to bring brands on to support the channel and now have a, a few that want to support and have been reaching out to me so that's pretty cool that's great what does it look like in terms of your favorite kind of, as you've progressed as an interviewer and your show, I guess, the charisma, what, what has really been a staple for you to feel like, wow, I'm getting better. And this is probably one of my favorite episodes What for our listeners to maybe hit that one first. What, what is your fave? I actually think my last uh, weekly news episode, I, I weirdly, usually I get, I don't know, I get pretty nervous when I speak and uh, yeah, that one, I just felt really comfortable, felt like I edited it pretty quick. I did a top 10 format of the news and just went uh, down the list. And uh, I think that's a better style for it that I found just doing, sticking to a certain amount, sticking to a certain time, time limit. Um, when I event, when I first started the news, I wanted to keep it below 10 minutes, but that's extremely difficult. I found that actually the shorter you try and make a video, the harder it is and the, uh, the more entertaining you try and make it basically. Uh, it takes more editing to make a video shorter than longer. Yeah. Um, the GTN show, for example, when I used to watch it, 
it's like 30 minutes long. Uh, it covers so much, which is awesome. But then the downside of that is, you know, uh, for example, I would click off after X amount of triathlon news and stuff if it wasn't, you know, quick and fast. And so I'm trying to balance that out a little bit more. Any YouTube algorithm hacks that you've learned along the way? Man, I mean, the biggest hack right now, I'd say it would be shorts for people. Um, you know, you can just have one just hit 10 million randomly for no reason and that that'll blow up your channel um honestly uh other than that it's everything you kind of probably already guessed having people watch the whole way through so giving people like reasons to stay till the end like doing the best piece of news is coming at the end or uh you know oh, the nice thing you're about like a cliffhanger guy Damn yeah you. i mean while well, like doing a 10 to 1 isn't so bad like um, you know, thumbnails can are kind of a bad aspect of YouTube and, and titles. It's it's kind of like, oh, man, I know if I make this title and thumbnail, people are going to click it. But also you're like, that's not quite the right story. So I'm trying to <laughs> find the right balance to that. It's kind I of get a lot a, of people a known thing with YouTube. It's like, as long as it's not a direct lie, you can kind of just like finagle the thumbnail to be like, oh, that's crazy. And then be like, oh, that's not exactly true, but I'm watching anyway. <laughs> so it's like, whatever. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, but I like it. I like that you have to leave something at the end. And like the other thing that's crazy with YouTube is like the first, the very first like few seconds of the video have to be like this is what I'm here to watch. And if it's like slow or like not quite there yet, so people are just because YouTube is like a ton of things people could watch, and they're like, what should I watch? It's a little different than you know, uh, like watching a movie or something where people pick one and they're just like settled into it. So it's kind of this weird. It, all the different social medias are different, but with YouTube especially, I found like you've got to have that first few seconds like dialed in to what you want or have a teaser or something that gets people roped into it. 100%. Yeah. So you did you ever have any background in any of this stuff before editing, audio? You know, how'd you learn? I got into it um, when I did a year traveling around the world and I started vlogging like Casey Neistat. I don't know if you've ever seen him on YouTube, but I've heard of him. But yeah, big blogging guy and I uh, tried it out for when I went traveling and just, uh, yeah, really loved editing and, and uh, showing people the videos and get, seeing their reaction. So that's why I kind of fell in love with it. Okay, well, I feel like we're going to hit a bit of news here that people have been waiting for because in the back of my mind, I'm like, you seem like you've got a pretty sick story and I want to hear more about that. Like for probably that you're maybe last, I guess, from your teens onward, you know, what were your ambitions? How did this lead you to triathlon? You know, the places you've lived, just a kind of a brief synopsis of what makes you who you are in this current state. And then also, did we even get a really good answer on the baked beans and toast? No, we didn't. If... Can you please include that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So like I said, born in Africa, uh, moved to Ireland uh, when I was really young, grew up there playing soccer. I was a really good elite level of soccer and just got called up to the national team for my age group. And, and so that was always what I wanted to do. It was like, I wanted to play soccer. Um, Did you call it then, football? Yes, I call it football. So I was just translating for you guys. Um, Thanks. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I mean, just fueled by baked beans on toast because uh, Zimbabwe, British colony, I mean, that British staple food, man, it's just so good. You guys got to try Ooh. it. You got to mix a little bit of cheese in there. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's too good. What kind of cheese? I've had it before. It reminds me of a much poorer time in my life. <laughs> well, that explains me then um yes so yeah just uh cheddar cheese for you nick there it's the best you know um anyways yeah so just fueled on that as i played a lot of soccer and you know crazy story my dad always wanted to move to the states and he met a cowboy while we were in ireland and uh he he told my dad to come on over you gotta check it out you know he just explained you got you would love wyoming best place ever and so he moved our whole family over to wyoming and it was just supposed to be for a year and uh lo and behold uh when we applied for our visa uh, it got stamped for four years and that never happens. Like getting into the States is super, super hard, we found out. And uh, for some reason, our visa got stamped for four years. But we always thought, oh, we're just going to stay for one year. So we went over to the States and I went to high school there and with my brother and we absolutely loved it. However, where we moved to in Wyoming, there was no track. I mean, no, uh, no soccer. Uh, it was just football and, and that. And immediately after putting on all the pads, I was like, OK, this is, this is definitely the wrong kind of football for me. 
uh, not into it. So I just started running a lot more. And um, just before we moved over, I remember watching the Ironman World Champs with my uncle. And he, he said to me, man, this is the one thing I always wished I would have done instead of all the marathons and stuff that I did, I always wish I did the world champs. And he said to me, you know what, Travis, I think it was a bit of reverse psychology, but he's like, I don't think you'd, you'd be able to do the Ironman world champs. I think he knew <laughs> that would just plant a, a seed in me to do it. How um, old were you? I was probably like 12, 13. Oh, yeah. that's I think we were, we were doing some ribbing back and forth. You know, I think I was saying to him, like, why didn't you, you know, kind of thing. So uh, he gave some reverse like, psychology. Off, you couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's that kind of guy. And uh, yeah, so I just always planted a seed in my mind. I've always been like a bucket list person. Like I always had a list written out of all the stuff I wanted to do. And like I mentioned earlier, I went and traveled for a year. That was all, you know, because of that bucket list thing. And the Ironman World Champs is always one number one because of that. For some reason, that seed he planted oh. in my mind was like, I got to do it. But, you know, funny enough, I've actually never done it uh, to cut to the point there. I've never Can done I it yet. Can I cut you to it? Can I coach? Oh man, back? yeah, yes. I would still love to do it. Yeah, <laughs> it's on the list. I'm kind of building back up towards it. But um, yeah, no soccer when I moved to Wyoming. I put me into running. Uh, my dad was always into cycling, so I bought a bike to cycle with him more. And uh, sure enough, then that Ironman thing on the bucket list, I kept seeing it, and uh, I was like, well, I signed up for an Olympic triathlon. And after doing my first one, I think like a lot of people, you just get hooked. And uh, since then, always been into it. I did my uh, first Ironman when I was uh, 23 and I did it in Whistler up by me here. Ooh. And um, that was a tough one. And yeah. Um, yeah, just then I did the piloting thing for three years, did all my ratings. Uh, luckily enough, I was able to do it through COVID. Um, and the university where I was at encouraged getting ratings for credits. So, and I didn't want to stay in university any longer. So I was like, I'm going to get as many ratings as I can. And uh, so I got out of university as quick as I could and yeah, and then just got back into triathlon, doing it myself. I've always followed the pros since my uncle told me about the world champs uh, all that time ago, always followed the pros. I just always thought Ooh. you guys were superheroes. Like I just, uh, just couldn't believe, you know, you know, the paces that you guys do for the length of an Ironman and a half Ironman just always blew my mind. And uh, so every year I always checked the Ironman World Champs results. I knew when it was, I always checked the results. And slowly every year I started recognizing more names. I wanted to see how so-and-so was doing, you know, how's Jan doing, uh, you know, et cetera. So um, yeah, it's just my love of the sport developed over the years. And uh, to the point where last year when I was back into it and training for a half Ironman with my dad, I uh, just got the idea for this channel and, um, you know, thought I could make a, a personal you know triathlon kind of journalism channel like we've talked about that's so cool now i gotta ask who was your your guy or gal in those early days of the sport when you were just kind of getting into it and watching these you know these superheroes because we are yeah. what were they who who was it who were your top guys and girls Sebastian Keenley for sure. Oh yes, I'm yeah. so glad you said that. <laughs> yeah, he was the man. It just seemed like such a great person too. He felt like the kind of guy I could go up to and talk to, you know, role model yeah. kind of person. So. Yep, he yeah, is. And you, for sure. yeah, yeah. And anything uh, else, Jackson? Um, I was just gonna say that the first time I ever like met Sebastian, pretty much, was that. Collins cop and he was just heading over a run and so was I and I was like hey you want to just jog together and then we just had like a really nice chat and just about what's going on with him and sport and everything and he's like a super like you said super chill guy that you can just talk to and he probably barely I mean I'd race him a couple times here and there but like it's not like you know he's multiple time world champ and I was like the guy who barely made the Collins cup so it was kind of cool <laughs> That's awesome. did you beat him uh well team europe won but i i went faster than him but we weren't in the same heat so we'll say no no contest, no contest. <laughs> okay so everyone went faster than me the next year except for sam Lalo, So <laughs> <laughs> at least you got that in your bank yeah um so the daily try what are some things you'd like to scale with the show um you started off you've got your feet wet it's you know it's getting noted i'm sure you've got already got some interest from some endemic sponsors to come on board and do some promotion and use their network. What would you like to do with this, you know, huge overwhelming endeavor that you've created for yourself? I know it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I mean, uh, 
recently I went to Ironman Texas and filming for Simon Chi and, and filming other pros. Uh, so that was great. And it got my mind thinking, I would love to go to more events and really become like a triathlon journalist per se, a triathlon reporter as well. And then uh, I saw Challenge Roth put up a, a competition per se to be their field reporter there. And oh. they said, send in a 90 second video. And so it was like a Sunday afternoon with my girlfriend. She's like, you got to do it. You got to do it. Go on, put an application and we'll think of something. And and uh, it was like the deadline for it. And I was like, OK, let's do it. Let's, we wrote this little script, made a funny video. And the next morning, they uh, I sent it off to them. The next morning, sure enough, I get a call from their office and they just said they were all dying of laughter. They loved it. Now they want me to be their field reporter. So I'm actually flying off to Challenge Roth and um, uh, you'll see me on the live stream there. And I mean, if it goes well, I think I would love to do that more with the channel, go to the events. I feel like that's something I could offer PTO Ironman challenge. Um, is something that they, you know, if they did that, if they hired somebody to do that from their department, I feel like it's, you know, it's not as relatable for a fan. Whereas, you know, fans follow me and the weekly news, um, every week and they know I'm not like hired on by any of these events necessarily, you know? Um, then I could provide a different perspective behind the scenes and uh, they can connect with me a little bit more. Um, so I would love to do that more, report from the races. Uh, I think that'd well be great. As, yeah, as well as, yeah, do more interviews, and keep doing the news and highlights. I think highlights would be the dream for me because they, they bring in a lot of views and I would love for fans to always have like Iron Man. I'm going to call them out a little bit for this. They put their highlights out and it seems like every year it gets worse and worse. Uh, recently, like Oceanside highlights came out like three weeks later and that drove me nuts. I was like, oh, there's like a hundred thousand people who watched the race, you know, but there's no highlights for those people who didn't get to or overseas, you know? So I would, uh, that's a, that's the long-term goal is to be able to do the highlights for the races. So a highlight, did you ever watch, there was this one channel that did like a few races last year a couple years ago i think it was called like the lonely triathlete or something and it would just like do the quick highlights of the races and it wasn't like high production or anything but it was the only thing that was like doing that and it's kind of interesting especially with long course triathlon in particular because you can't if someone wants to know what happened in the in in a full you can just look at the results and you can kind of go through the splits but having a summary of like what was going on in the race really tells a much better story of like how did the packs play out and how did the swim play out who kind of went forward and back and that kind of thing like is that what you kind of want to do that but like on a bit of a higher scale and just like kind of more consistently yeah definitely i've i've done even a few videos um i know iron man's really cracked down on this i can't say too much about it because of uh just legality and the emails you got cracked down on is that why Tons of people, they're cracking down on everybody, basically, in that space and just general copyright, which, I mean, that's their right. It is their material. Um, I hope they open up to, you know, to more of that, um, because I think, you know, it's something that wouldn't hurt them at all if, uh, you know, and it help the sport grow. But like you said, Jackson, um, back to your point, I, uh, I did a few videos where I just used the tracker and I just had generic pictures from the race or pictures that people sent me from the race or videos. And I got, would get like five, 10,000 views on some of them. People just wanted, and they would all, th you know, got tons of message people thanking me. Like I just broke down the race. Why did so-and-so come out of the swim, you know, in the second pack versus the first pack, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I just felt like there's a huge, huge need for that. People are really interested. And, and for me, like if it's, you know, an 18 year old's watching that and it gets him into the sport because I'm speaking excitedly about why Jackson didn't make the, second pack or third pack or first pack you know um then he'd be more interested swimming <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah it was just like you know it, um just the generic highlights that iron man uh, would put out you know they don't include a lot of that detail or you know so that's something i would like to do well that whole perspective is near and dear to all of us um, especially on the real tri squad we talk about it in our little group chat we have um over you know a, a lot of topics come up and one of them is always like well i guess we're going to watch one person for the whole broadcast because that seems to where the camera just tends to always go back to is the the one or two people so for what your vision is and what it's going to take to make the rest of the athletes have a voice and story the climb up that mountain is going to be big but i do i don't think it's going to take like like once you get the formula right and you can kind of 
figure out what you need to be valuable and also how to do it quickly. It'll take you a day and a half maybe to to get it nailed down per episode. But I think that you'll have everything you need to really shed some light on what the sport needs more than anything is depth and stories of heroism that you'd never hear ever. Like why, you know, Jackson sometimes would come out with me in the swim and then he'd ride away all the way to the front and they wouldn't really talk about it as much. And then instead they'd only talk about one other guy doing that, who's done it his whole career, but now someone else is doing it too. And they just don't really share a lot of that story. So I, I would even the, you know, the women too, obviously there's tons of stories. I'd love to hear more of it. So thank you so much for, I mean, I know what it takes to do something that's not being done and it's annoying and it's really frustrating and it, you, people are like, not going to give you a lot of money and then eventually they will give you a little money and then the, then the money away. Will be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. The industry is a pain in the ass. Mm. Yeah. Well, th- yeah. Thanks for the encouragement. I told I my partner, was encouragement, give, but... uh, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> giving myself till I'm 30. I'm 27. Now I told my girl, I'm going to go at it till I'm 30. If I, you know, don't make it full time or it just doesn't work out. Yeah. I'm going all in until, you know, I want to make this work and hopefully nice. uh, yeah, do this. So I'm committed to the long haul. That's the thing with flying too. Like 99% of the people, they quit uh, on their private pilot's license, but they're so close. And uh, being a flight instructor, you know, I could see the people were so close and you just have to wait till it clicks, you know? Uh, and if it does, then you'll be fine. Or like one bad experience puts them off like a whole life of flying and seeing amazing things. But, you know, it's the same even just doing the channel, which isn't a big deal at all. But there's many moments I've wanted to quit. You know, you get a bad comma and you get somebody, you got one guy who comments every single time without fail, just I'm an idiot. What am I doing with my life? Why am I making these videos? You know, it's like, I kind of appreciate him for the algorithm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh, I wish he was doing more YouTube speaking of. But yeah, it's just, you know, things like that can make you want to quit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a Sunday night and I don't want to do the news, you know, there's no real news to do, but it's just about being consistent. And yeah. So, well, uh, the prime example you have for what can become with hard work, grinding it out is, you know, Eric Lagerstrom and TTL. They've, I mean, he was one of the first guys who started vlogging the daily triathlon life all the time. And if you look at him now, like the followers, the love for that whole um, organization that he's starting to create is, is fantastic. So I think he's proof that there's a need for more of it too, because he's, he's got one perspective and yours is going to be different, but also as valuable. It just as much as all of us working together. And I think that's probably the biggest thing we've learned, even as a smaller podcast is, as we are, is like, we need to start talking with more fellows like yourself who are already doing the same thing that we're trying to do so we can all tell a unified story like even on different continents even that's there's totally different perspectives we're not even really tapping into especially since different continents are going to care about different athletes more than anything and i think that's probably most notably is like you go to europe yeah. and they're gonna you're gonna go start line they're gonna wonder who the hell jackson landry is um <laughs> but when you come to north america it's like a different story and the same thing with when I was racing in Austria and Europe so much on that P bag racing team, I'd be the only American out of like 60 dudes. It was nuts. And that's the only reason why everyone was like, Oh, that's the American. Like that's, that's all he would know. (laughs) So I think it's a, we've got a lot of gaps to fill as a, as a unified front. So anyways, uh, the daily try, I think you've got a lot of, you know, bigger enthusiasm. When I was on the interview with you, you asked great questions, you do some research. So we don't do any of that. And I think that you're going <laughs> to be way more put together than we are. No, we do. Come on. We we look at the results. We look at the start list. We, we do, do that while we're talking about it. We'll like, oh, let me no. pull through results. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes we do a bit of research, but yeah. we. Hey, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a pro athlete, so you guys got an excuse, yeah. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't be hard. Doing the race is a form of research. Sometimes we do the race. True, so true story. That's true. Um, you guys yeah. bring perspective. I never could. Well, and, and that being said, if you ever need any more out of us, whatever network we have, we can ever collaborate and bring more. If you know one of our athletes or one of our age groupers, 
whatever, or our, infl- or our um, developmental athletes is racing a race and you want to talk about some inherent or some very, not inherent, some very s- specific details about a race from so- an athlete on the ground the day after or whatever, or the day of, I think that'd be cool just to get a quick soundbite about, man, that swim was brutal or like the, the waves just threw Jackson right over top me. And then I just kept going. I had dropped him right away. Like those little stories are really what make the the personality. So lean on us, if nothing else, as we, as we get going and we, we'd love to help you. That sounds amazing. Yeah. That would be um, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Add a lot of uh, personality to the show and the highlights. That would be great. And I would love to have everybody from the real triathlon squad on listening to you talk about it. It's just sounded like, why isn't there more of this? This needs to be the future of the sport. So yeah. Super cool. Uh He he knows what's up. He gets it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We're going to be the first pro run squad. Then everyone's gonna copy us, and Nick's gonna be like, "See, told you guys, this is the best." And then they're gonna make, they're gonna get like billions, and we'll still be getting millions. I'll be like, "God damn it, we started this thing. We're getting <laughs> <hosed."> <laughs> just copyrighted yeah. or patented." We just need something. to go and get. We just need to go and get like Gustav Eaton on our team. Just be like, "Come on, man, we can pay you like <laughs> five grand." <laughs> <laughs> we'll take in some. I can give you like some real good. I've got a lot of spare parts in my garage. I can just, (laughs) we'll sell those off. I got a lot of bike stuff. (laughs) You guys have a pretty cool kit too. So you can offer him the kit. Ah, Yeah. Maybe he likes our style. Can you do do us a favor and can you send Tamara Jew a message specifically and say, Hey, I just want to let you know that kit looks real good. I I love that kit. (laughs) You got to do it. Specifically. I like it a lot more than the one you were wearing last year. (laughs) <laughs> no, no. <laughs> she's that's a bit of an internal joke within the team she's she was really wanting to keep her kit from last year and we were like we just gotta look all alike Tamara. we would love it if you you did we'd appreciate it a lot and she did and she, but she'll always make little jabs about it which is it's all in good fun um but anyways i think that pretty much covers it we will put links to the daily try in the show notes um and on the video podcast asset we'll link you in tag you and dude we'll i'm sure we'll be seeing more of you and i think that that challenge raw thing is going to be like fire like you're going to just take off and to another level especially if you can do something super cool on camera with like one of your awesome accents (laughs) i'm sure you can speak some cool accents oh thanks guys i really appreciate it yeah Uh, it's been a great time i I really think uh (laughs) I really think you I uh, can't wait to watch the real triathlon squad grow a lot more. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the, the links that you said. I just wanted to say if anybody else wanted to, uh, you know, uh, get to know me a little bit more that uh, I do do live watch alongs as well for the race, some of the bigger races. Oh. And, uh, you know, the last time we did the PTO European Open, I had 600 people in there watching with me and chatting away. So that was really fun. So, um, yeah, that's a good way to get to know me, ask questions mm-hmm. as well. So how could people find that? Is that just through Instagram or is that going to be through your yeah. website? So I'll put on Instagram when I'm doing it and it'll, it'll be live on the YouTube channel during the race. So just click on the race. Yeah. Ooh, I lo- dude, you're awesome. You're doing <laughs> us awesome service. That's a sick well, anyways, idea. We thought about doing that once and then we we're just organized, never did it, but do it with well, daily try. Cause he's actually going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the part of that plan is to have others on and have interviews go in and insight. So I might call on you guys during one of the races if you're not racing it. So, yeah, I've done an Ironman broadcast or two, and it's not very fun because they don't ask you really anything. They just like, well, you <laughs> biked up this hill once, Nick. What do you think? All right, talk to you later. Like, I had, <laughs> had more to say. <laughs> oh, it was hard. Okay, cool. Frig off. Yeah. See you later, Nick. You didn't make top 10. Bye. (laughs) Um, All right. But anyways, we will put all the information and thanks so much, Travis. We're going to have you really on our radar as we go forward. Um, And also if you're listening, go follow the daily try on Instagram. We will put a link in the show notes for that as well. We need to get that followership up over a million real quick. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a blast. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, bud. I got ish to do, flying through the sky in my parachute, dancing on the couch like I'm Tommy Cruise on a one-man mission trying to see it through.